The dialog for changing attributes and timestamps now allows you to copy times from various image and document metadata tags over the file's main created and modified timestamps. You can now have a button which creates a predefined list of folders, but also lets you see and edit the list first. This is handy if you need to create the same folders in a lot of places, but sometimes need to deviate from your normal template. The button I've been clicking runs this command, and it creates folders with names like these. The first line gets the current date and stores it into a variable since we're going to use it in several places. The second line runs the create folder command with the ask argument, which tells it to always display a prompt even when the command line specifies folder names. If the ask argument was not here, the command would just create the folders without showing a prompt. The rest of the command line is the list of folders to create, with each name in quotes. The last name creates a folder with two child folders below it, and they're separated by a pipe character. The file display border, directly above each file display, can now host multiple toolbars instead of just one. Buttons on these toolbars always affect only the file display that they are over, even if it is inactive, so this is a great place to put shortcuts to frequently use folders. To create a folder shortcut, go into Customize mode and drag something to the toolbar. This now works with file collections as well. You can also drag web pages from web browsers onto your toolbars, except from Microsoft Edge because it's terrible. And this also works with the URL shortcut files, which are already on disk. You can also do this with images and documents if you have things that you need to access in a hurry and want a button for them on your toolbar. Steam shortcuts are also now supported, and here I'm dragging two of them to a docked toolbar at the top of my screen. This creates buttons which will launch Steam, passing it the ID of the game which you wish to run. So clicking the button launches the game. If you drag an .exe file to a toolbar, the new Launch Options dialog appears. This allows you to choose how to run the program via a simple list of checkboxes. You can say the program should be run on its own, or you can have it pass a list of selected files to run the program on those files. You can choose whether or not the program runs asynchronously, as well as some other details. The choices you make here are reflected in the command preview near the bottom. This preview helps new users become familiar with the Opus command syntax without having to write any of it from scratch. Not all software can be run in the same way, so it's a good idea to test that the choices you've made work with the program you're trying to run. You can do that here without leaving the dialog, and refine your choices if necessary before creating the button. In this case, I'm making a button which runs Notepad, and I'd like to make sure it will run Notepad against any selected files. The dialog allows me to add an example file to test the command, and I'm selecting a file with text data inside, as that's something that Notepad can edit. Now, when I click the Test button, Notepad opens with the file I chose, and I know my choice has worked. I also want this button to be able to run Notepad on its own, without any file, so I'll clear the file list and do another test run. That works as well, so we're good, we can click OK, and now the button is created. If needed, we can open the button in the normal editor and change any additional details. Within this command editor, the Browse menu now allows you to insert the path of various things into the command. You can add the path to a file or folder, or to one of your FTP bookmarks. You can also now insert one of your path aliases, or one of the built-in aliases, by selecting them from this menu. The built-in aliases take you to various standard system folders without having to worry about paths being different on different machines or with different user accounts. If you're wondering about these funny looking alias names, they're ones I created to go to paths which I use a lot by only having to type a couple of letters into the file display. For example, the D alias takes me to my downloads folder. The albums alias takes me to my CD collection, so I can just type slash albums into the file display and I'm there. Back in the command editor, if you push F1 or the help icon while on the line with an at modifier, it will now open the help page that describes all the modifiers. If you do the same thing on a line which runs an internal command, it will open the help page for that command. The help file is now displayed in your web browser, although you can switch back to the old help viewer if you preferred it. The documentation is still stored locally and opens instantly even when you're offline, it's just displayed by a different program. If you click the link icon at the top of any page, it will take you to the online version of the same document, which can be handy if you want to share the page with other people. 
If you have some text in the clipboard, Opus can now show a preview of that text when you hover over the Paste button, and that lets you see what will be created if you go ahead and paste the data. Pasting text data into Opus creates a new text file with the data inside it. This also works with image data. If you have an image in your clipboard, the Paste button can now show a thumbnail of it, so you know what you're about to save into a new file. I've configured Opus to save clipboard image data into bitmap files, or BMP, but you can also use ping and JPEG as well, or GIF if you want. If you like this preview feature, you may wish to move the Paste button out of your edit menu and onto your main toolbar, so it's easier to hover over it. Of course, you can also paste directly using Ctrl V. The default toolbars contain buttons for copying the names and paths of files in various formats. Most of these run variations of the clipboard copy names command. This one places the full path to each selected file into the clipboard with each file on a separate line. We've added a new quote parameter, which tells this command to always put quotes around the names and paths, even if they're on separate lines and even if they don't contain spaces. Most hotkeys in Opus fall into one of two types. Standalone hotkeys are commands which only exist as hotkeys and can only be edited via the Customize Keys page. Toolbar hotkeys are the other main type, and this is where a hotkey is assigned to something which already exists on a toolbar or menu. The hotkey list now has a column which tells you the toolbar, if any, which each item comes from. You can double-click any hotkey to edit its command, and if it's a toolbar hotkey, you'll also be editing the corresponding button on the toolbar. If you select a toolbar hotkey and then click Locate, Opus will show it on its toolbar, opening any menus if required, and flash the individual button. The OnOpenLister scripting event is triggered when a new Lister window opens, but it runs before any of the folder tabs for that window have been created. That was a problem if you wanted your script to do things to or with those folder tabs, since they didn't exist yet when your script was called. These scripts can now request that the unopen lister event be called a second time after the tabs are open for those situations. New button modifiers allow you to disable or even completely hide buttons in different situations. Here I'm using the hide if path modifier to have a virus scan button which is only visible when I'm in my downloads folder. I have a similar button for extracting archives. When I exit Customize mode, both buttons disappear because I'm in my Desktop folder. When I go into my Downloads folder, the buttons appear again. So now, if you have buttons which only make sense in particular folders, you don't have to cluster up your toolbar by showing them all the time. You can also have buttons which only appear in certain display modes. I'm in Details mode now, but if I switch into Thumbnails, two buttons appear for rotating images. If I switch back to Details again, the buttons are hidden again. These buttons do work in Details mode, but they're a bit hard to use when you can't see what's going on. The buttons use the Hide If modifier to test the state of the internal command for setting the view mode. This isn't restricted to the Set View command, you can use it with any stateful internal commands. Another new feature is the ability to disable buttons depending on the number of files that are selected. This button runs a program which compares two files, so it only makes sense to enable it when two files are selected. When nothing is selected, the button is disabled, and the same is true after selecting a single file. But with two files selected, the button is enabled, and now I can use it. The new If Running modifier allows buttons to do different things if a program is already running. In this example, if Notepad is already running, then the button will display a message box. If Notepad is not running, the button will launch it instead. So the first time I click the button, it launches Notepad. If I click it again with Notepad already running, I get the message box. Close Notepad and click it again, and it will reopen Notepad, and so on. File context menus have always allowed you to add normal sub-menus, such as this one. If you were paying close attention, you may have noticed a new type of menu. Clicking the label or icon part will run a command directly, while the drop-down arrow on the right can be clicked to access additional options in a sub-menu. 
This is just like the button menus that you can use on normal toolbars and menus, but you couldn't do this in file context menus until now. To create one of these in a context menu, create a sub-menu the way you normally would, then right-click the first item inside the menu and turn on the button option. That first item will then become the action of the top-level button part. Now, let's say I have two versions of the same file, and I'm going to copy one over the other. The Replace File dialog opens again. As these are text files, I can hover over the thumbnails to enlarge the preview slightly and see a little bit more of the start of each file. That can be useful sometimes, but in this case both files start with the same text, so it's not really giving me a clue about where the differences are. I can also double-click the thumbnails to open the two files, and while that's great sometimes, especially for images, it's still not really helping in this case. Comparing two text files is best done using a dedicated comparison tool, and it would be nice to be able to run such a thing from here. When you right-click a thumbnail, you get the context menu for that file, and that's not new, but you can now add special items which only appear in the Replace File dialog, and which run commands on both files at once. I've added this item for Beyond Compare, and when I select it, I can now instantly see the differences between the two files. To set this up, I went to the All Files file type, and added a command to the new Replace Menu tab. This command runs Beyond Compare, and it passes both the name of the file that's being copied, and the name of the file that's about to be replaced. Most comparison tools work in the same way, but some may require additional arguments. You should check the manual for your comparison tool. The last two years have seen many improvements to the scripting API. There isn't time to cover those in detail, but all the new stuff is in the scripting reference section of the manual. The API for script dialogues has also seen many improvements, and this interactive script example was posted to a forum by Bytespiller. The UI for designing script dialogues has also seen improvements. You can find lots of other scripts on the forum, such as this one posted by Wowbagger, which lets you add your own custom columns using regular expressions. Or this script, posted by T-Bone, which gives you an extended version of the built-in select command. For those and lots of other scripts, check out the forum. Speaking of the forum, the last thing I want to show you is the secure screenshot feature. This allows you to take a screenshot of a lister or even your whole desktop, hiding any files which may contain private or confidential information, or may simply be extremely embarrassing, and not something you want to post in public, but you've got those files just spilling out of every folder on your computer and you, you, know, you can't possibly change directories and go somewhere that doesn't have them because they're everywhere, so you know this will help you. Cheers. Okay, I think that's been plenty for today. If you got this far, thank you very much for watching and making it worth making this video. We'll have more updates for you soon, and until then, goodbye. When copying to a removable drive that becomes